All right. So I only have like 43 minutes left. And so I'm going to go ahead and jump into uh, this thing, if y'all don't mind. So right now, there are some sticky notes being passed around. I'm asking all of you all to take two sticky notes and keep passing the rest of them throughout the rest of the audience uh, because you will need them in about a second because this is how we're going to do a fairly quick poll in the room to determine how the rest of this time we spend together is. And so as we begin the topic of emotional intelligence, this session is designed to be interactive. So there may be moments that I may say, Chief Mass Sergeant Tony Bostick, will you go to a microphone? Or I might say, uh, Chief Mass Sergeant Jamie Munn, will you move to a microphone so that you can breathe some life into this room? Then that'll be like your moment. Otherwise, y'all got to listen to me the whole time. And I don't know that y'all want to do that. And so in this process, you may have seen on the schedule that it listed out as emotional intelligence. We are going to, in my opinion, take it a step further and not just talk about the intelligence portion. This session can be termed emotionally connected. And so as we get ready to begin, I have what I like to refer to as three simple asks. Ask number one is that you find one thing that you can accept. We will cross many paths during this time that we have together. There will be things that I say, there will be images that come up on the screen. There will be moments when your teammates will move to a microphone and they will say some stuff. And in that whole process, you don't even have to agree with it 100%. You just gotta hear it, you gotta see it, you gotta experience it and say, I guess I can accept that. That's ask number one, find something that you can accept. Number two, Find something that you can begin to practice. And that, in my opinion, is the major difference than a lot of the things that you may experience. Finding purposefully and being intentional to find one thing that you see, experience here, and say, I'm going to start practicing that. If you are anything like me, you have been around some of the smartest, stupidest people you ever met in your life. Where you're like, man, they're wicked smart. And then you're around them for a moment, and you're like, and you're looking around like, yo, am I being punked? Like, there's no way. And so that's how we stop that from happening to y'all. Because otherwise, you would just be emotionally intelligent. You would just know some stuff, but not necessarily do some stuff. And so finding something to practice transitions you into a practitioner, because now you are intentionally finding one thing, going out and practicing it every day. Ask number three. I've been given an opportunity to stand on this illustrious platform to, to be here with you all today to talk about being emotionally connected. And I know what some of y'all are thinking as I walked back and forth up here. You're like, yo, I see the SF thing on his shoulder, son. Right, right. And right then and there, you was like, ain't nothing this defender finna say to me gonna make sense because he don't know nothing about being emotionally intelligent because defenders ain't emotionally intelligent. I know that's what y'all think, wrong. Because it's up to you to choose what you accept, what you begin to practice. And on this third one, here in this moment, if I do okay, then I'll pour something into you. But if I do my job well, then I'll pour something into you, and then you will go out and pour it into someone else. If I do it phenomenally, then I'll pour something in you. You'll take it back to your unit and pour it into your senior NCOs and your NCOs, and then they'll go and they'll pour it into their airmen because better people make better airmen. And so I have thought about the product of the product of the product of the product. So find one thing that you can share. That's it, three simple asks, something you can accept, something you can begin to practice, and then something that you can share with someone else. And then I got one standing rule of engagement, and that is that you give yourself permission to interrupt me. Yeah, yeah, you, you get to Kanye West me. Now I'm not gonna say go up there on the stage and do it, but you get to walk over to a mic and be like, yo, D, 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 hold up. 
I got something and then you can breathe life and share it in this room. So you can give yourself permission to Kanye West me this afternoon. If it's burning in your chest and you just got to get it out. I learned from the last briefing. Y'all better get y'all ass up, move to the mic because the people up in here don't like it when you try to do it from your seat. So stand up, move to the mic and then breathe some life into this room. That's it. One thing you can accept, one thing you can begin to practice one thing you can share with someone else and then give yourself permission to interrupt. All right, everybody has two sticky notes at this point or something similar to that. There are some butcher block pieces of paper on the side walls and I know you can't see what's on there right now. I did that on purpose because then you can't see it until you get up on it. So don't worry about that part. But you have two sticky notes. We're going to take a moment and I'm going to ask you to hop in your DeLorean with me and I want you to go back to the future and I want you to stop at a negative, toxic, disruptive, a bad leader. That's the place where I want you to be. I want you to see him. I want you to remember it. I want, I want you to feel it. You know who that person is. There is a word that you would use to define that leader, their attributes, their characteristics, how they did business, what made them so toxic. There is a word that you would use, and it's your word, it's your sticky note. You don't have to write your name on it, so you, got, you can be anonymous, so you can write down pretty much anything you want. And so now it's your turn to write down what that word is on your sticky note. That one word that you would use for bad, negative, or toxic leader that you've had in the past. So I have been, as y'all write that, what's that? It only, his question was PG-13, R-rated, or does it matter? It don't even matter. Your word, nobody gonna know but you, and maybe your creator if you believe one, what you wrote down on that piece of paper today. And just so y'all know, I keep all of the sticky notes. I'm gonna need more. Hold, hold up. No, 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 I, I know you. I, I know the guy you're talking about. Here you go, whole stack, that's for you. <laughs> all right, and so now that you got your word, it's your word, just so you know, I keep all of the sticky notes because I've been collecting the data for two and a half years. Not just where people put their sticky notes, but also the words that they use if they were defining good or bad leaders. So now you have your sticky note, you've written down the word for that bad leader, I want you to put it to the side. And I don't want you to stay there, now hop back in your DeLorean, and I want you to go back to the future, to that place of a good leader. Someone who poured into you, or people around you, maybe you stole some of their swag and you infused it into your own leadership style and it helped make you who you are. There is also a word that you would use to define or describe that good leader. Write that word down as well. So you should have two sticky notes and by the time you're done, you'll have two words, minimum. One bad word on one sticky note a good word on the second sticky note for that good leader. And once you have that, you will notice in a moment, in a moment, I'm gonna ask you to pop tall and move to where those sets of paper are hung. You're gonna notice that there will be three quadrants when you get over there. One quadrant, and, and, and I color coded them to help you all out, because I know like how it is sometimes, you know what I'm saying? Green is for the good leader, Red is for the bad leader. So when you move to the chart, if you got your two sticky notes and you get all confused, you can just remember green, good, red, bad. See, I already thought about y'all. Once you get up there, there are three quadrants. One labeled IQ, one labeled tech, one labeled EQ or EI. In this instance, we're talking about being emotionally connected. Good or bad, doesn't matter. Where you place your word is up to you. But if you believe your word belongs in the IQ section, then you'll just post it up in IQ. We're just talking about cognitive capacity, how wicked smart someone is in a good way or possibly in a bad way. 
when we're looking at technical or technical ability, that is how well someone does the job. That's it. They're a subject matter expert, they're a technician or a tactician, or they are not. But then when we look at EQ, that's about being emotionally connected, emotionally intelligent, good or bad. And so now, remember, two sticky notes, bad word, good word, red, green, three quadrants. Go, post them up. All right, all right, we got everybody moving back towards their seats now. And so during the next break, please take a moment to go back to the charts to check out what you all have said. What you all just did in this quick down and dirty survey is what I've noticed over the last two and a half years. When I first started this, what I had expected to observe is that given the opportunity to write a good or bad word, in the process for us, what we would think was most important was technical ability. The mission first, mission always, first, foremost, people, kinda, sorta, sometimes, eventually, if there's ever time when we get back to, I mean, we're still trying to strive for this work-life balance thing. So yeah, we'll, we'll get back to you, but keep cranking away, keep defending, keep turning jets, keep flying, keep doing the mission. And so initially going into it, I said it's gonna be technical ability. But the thing that I've begun to notice as I've done this over and over again, and it did not matter the audience, whether it was airmen or chiefs, general officers, field grade officers, airmen, guardian, soldiers, sailor, marines, coasties, it did not matter. 2% of the time, well, like 2.7, so almost 3% of the time, those sticky notes went to IQ. 5% of the time, those sticky notes went to technical ability but overwhelmingly, 92% of the time, and this is a small microcosm here in the room, 92% of the time, we, Defenders of America, said that emotional intelligence is important, that it's making or breaking our leaders, but we haven't invested as much time in it in the past. We hadn't been evaluated on it in any sort of way in the past, and now that's changing. Chief Bostick, I see you next to the mic. Is Chief Munns in here? Chief Munns, anybody? No, she like hiding out? It's, I mean, it's okay. I was standing in the back. I went through the roster. I know some of y'all up in here. Like, <laughs> so she don't want to show up. Next person up on the list. Chief uh, McCracken, Chief McCracken, I know you up in here. Natasha, you know I'm talking to you. Where you at? Where you at, Chief McCracken? And the people around you know you up in here too because they looking at you and, and you keep trying to act like it's not you. I don't, I don't heard a name tape. <laughs> like it's not you. Hold on. Is that, is that Chief Munns over there? Or is that Chief McCracken? She like, what, man, just come on with your class, man. Come on with your class. Okay, okay. Chief Boston, it's your job to define emotional intelligence. That's your job. And I, I, and I purposefully didn't tell y'all what the question was going to be because I didn't want you to be able to Google it. I wanted everybody in here to know how smart you are, Sergeant Bostic. Represent for the defenders. Hey, hey, if you need some help, just let me know. I, I will. Okay. okay, define emotional intelligence. So um, emotional intelligence is, the, is to have the ability, this is what I believe it is, is to have the ability to assess a situation, um, not to get overwhelmed by it, and to be able to act in a balanced manner. Um, to be able to recognize the situation and be sure you're not, you're using the right amount of uh, force or the right amount of uh, non-force, if I can say a better word, in order you don't make the situation even worse. So be aware of your, be aware of your, around, your surroundings and not overreact, basically. Being aware of your surroundings, not overreacting for the defenders in the room, when to use force, when not to use force, All right? All right? Okay, okay. What he said? That's what. 
Ditto, right? No, so the way that I, that I see it is, you know, it's not only the ability to recognize the emotions of others and then to manage it within ourselves, but it's also to learn from those experiences, right? To retrain your brain so as we have those experiences, we learn from it, we grow, and we don't let it get us caught up in those cognitive traps or, you know, set us off and we go from zero to 100. We learn over time that with each situation that we go through, we can manage it, overcome it, and, you know, learn how to just progress and, and be happy. Yeah. Would you you got some more? You got some more, Chief Boston? Go Damn, ahead, that go is, ahead. That is a non-comp master. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. There's this cognitive aspect. Thank y'all. Y'all can have a seat. Everybody, give them a round of applause. Such, such beautiful definitions. <laughs> Our ability to be in a situation, not overreact, to, to understand cognitively that there are things happening not only with inside and to us, but also the people that we are interacting with, and then to be able to respond appropriately. Yeah. That is what it's about. And so, so far, we've determined that emotional intelligence is a thing. I put quadrants on a piece of paper. I gave you some sticky notes. I said, put it where you believe your word belongs. And so far, overwhelmingly, a lot of y'all place your sticky notes in the emotional intelligent quadrant. So it is a thing. If it is a thing, then we should be able to define it. We just defined it. If it's a thing and we can define it, then there should be some elements or I like to refer to as ingredients that make it. So I offer you three ingredients, self-awareness, emotional management, and emotional connectedness. Working from the bottom up, self-awareness. That triangle that you see, it's not just a triangle. It is a prism that allows light to shine in, to spotlight those blind spots, to dispel those shadowy areas. We have to allow light to shine in. Some of the light that I would offer you, self-assessments, self-reflection, 360 feed forward. That's just three simple things right off the bat that I would offer to you. Self-reflection, that's where we pull that mirror out. What went well today? What didn't go according to plan? How can I be better in the next moment of my life than I was in this one? What do I need to work on? But we don't stop there. The mirror is awesome, but we can't put a period there. We've got to put a comma. Because if we are only pulling out the mirror, then there are times where we may be trapped in the prison that is our own thoughts, our own perspectives and our own way of doing things and can't nobody tell us nothing. We pull out that mirror, but we don't stop there. Some assessments, and I know there are a lot of them and y'all are like, man, I don't always agree with all the assessments. It's a leadership buffet. If it resonates, if it speaks to you, if it points out a tendency, take it, put it on your plate. But no one should walk away hungry. There's enough for all of us to be eating. Take those assessments. Myers-Briggs, five love languages, four lenses. Self-awareness is a major piece of it. And then 360 feed forward. While I was assigned here under Air University, I got a fabulous opportunity to go through an executive coaching certification. And while I was doing it, one of the things that I stopped saying is, can I get some feedback? I told y'all, you know, I'm a defender. So I would go in, I'd be like, hey, can I get some feedback? You suck, suck less. Can I get some feedback? Just keep doing what you're doing. Everything? Yeah, just, just all that stuff, it's all good. Just keep doing what you're doing. Can I, can I get some, some feedback? You're just not our guy. 
Not this year. Well, who's the guy? The other guy. Well, what is he doing? The stuff that you're not doing. But you told me to keep doing everything that I was doing. <laughs> yeah, but I also told you you're sucking to suck less. The stuff that you suck at, it's it kind of like differentiated between you and the other guy. So, so what am I supposed to do? Suck less, bro. But the moment I learned to ask for feed forward, can you give me one thing that will make me better in the next moment when I have another opportunity like this? The stuff I begin to receive, very different than me just asking for feed back. And then one of my favorite, with this 360 feed forward, who you take light from. Somebody you look up to, can they pour some light into your prism? Someone who you look at, who's on your level, who is your peer. And sometimes that is the most difficult person to take some from. Because like, you already feel like I'm a waste of oxygen and skin. Uh, my zipper is like barely making it up over you know, my coffee gut. I'm testing out the tensile strength in this uniform and my belt every day I come in. Uh, my animal spirit, because I took one of those assessments on Facebook. Remember I told y'all assessments are important. My animal spirit, I'm a cheetah. It's my animal spirit, in case y'all want to know. Not doing my PT test, but all the rest of the other time, I'm a cheetah. And now here we are, and I come by to you, and I got this plank hanging out my eye, and I see a speck in yours, and I want to stop and give you some advice. Sometimes that's the hardest thing, to be in a position to still receive something, knowing that somebody else is all messed up, but they want to comment on your stuff. And then somebody who looks up to you. Can you afford to allow someone who looks up to you to hold you accountable to something? Who better? You already told your airmen, your guardians, what you wanted to be known for or known as. Who better to hold you accountable to some of those things than the people who are on the brunt end of every decision that you make? When you decide to use force or to not use force. Chief Bostic, I'm with you, bro. Allow some light to shine in. And if we had time and we went around this entire room, there would be more responses like my mom, my dad, my brother, my sister, all of it is light shining in, and then we become illuminated and aware. And the first block that falls into place, emotional management. Y'all heard the definition earlier, sometimes to stop you from going from zero to 100 real quick. Don't mind, it's, it's just my faces. I can't help it. If I don't like, I always walk around like something stinking here because y'all stinking here, and, and y'all need some work. I can't, I can't help this, and the truth is, is I haven't practiced it. I haven't intentionally thought about the way I look at people and how I go from zero to 100 real quick. And, and that maybe I'm falling into some ethical traps of loyalty syndrome or my own personal drive for success. How can you check those things? And instead of being reactionary for everything, take a moment to reflect to think, to seek outside input before you go and advise your commander. Emotional management. The next block to fall into place, emotional connectedness. How we connect emotionally with the emotions of others. And I know I said emotions about 50, 11,000 times in that one stream of consciousness, but that is what it's about. This thing of being emotionally connected, it's a whole nother language. It's still a way that we communicate, but it's just a different dialect. You can learn this dialect. And it doesn't mean that you'll be able to predict how people feel or what's going on inside of them, but there'll be this place where you recognize, in order for me to walk a mile in someone's shoes, I gotta take mine off. I gotta put theirs on. And then I got to ask them to travel this mile with me so that I understand the nuances that are their life. That's how we start to move the needle. That's how we care more about our people. We got to start asking them. 
Those are three core ingredients that I offer you for being an emotionally connected, not just senior enlisted leader, not just airmen, but human being. Because again, better people make better airmen. And then there's that fourth thing that doesn't land. Because for me, it never does. My personal leadership style. Because I am always striving to be self-aware striving to be emotional management, striving to be emotional connectedness. Because what got me here won't get me there. And so every day I strive so that you never encounter a defender who will come up and say a whole bunch of bad stuff about Chief Booth. That if you took this same chart and you placed it in my organization and you said to everyone, I want you to think about Chief Booth, that, that there would be very few bad words that they would say about how I treat them, how I take care of them, how I look after them, how I advise the commander in the organization. It doesn't mean that business doesn't have to get done because it does. It doesn't mean that there's a lack in standards. There aren't. But I can still love you and care about you. There ain't nothing you can do about it. And I can still hold you accountable at the same time. That is what it's about. Being self-aware, having some emotional management, some emotional connectedness, and allowing it to flow into your personal leadership style. The image you see up on the screen now, I, I like it. I know there are some who don't subscribe to the triune brain theory anymore. Check. Roger that. But for me, it offers a great schematic as we go into where emotional intelligence lives. Because we said it's a thing. We were able to define it. There are some ingredients that make it on those green charts. Y'all have outlined some citizenship behaviors that need to exist inside of your organization. So go back later, take some pictures. Don't steal none of my sticky notes. I told y'all I'm trying to like track some data. So you can just take some pictures, leave them up there. I'll take them down later. That's the stuff that has to exist in your organization. The stuff that's in red, counterproductive behaviors. That's the stuff we want to root out of our ecosystems that are our organizations. Triune brain theory. Introduced in the mid-1960s, we all have a reptilian brain that handles the survival functions that when we don't really have to think about it, the body just does it automatically. Na name some stuff that your reptilian brain, and popcorn style, just shout it out, does for you that you don't ever have to think about. Breathing. Breathing. Did somebody say moan? Dri sometimes driving home, Roger that, autopilot. Hey, hey, watch that guy over there. He, ain't, he don't know what, he's just out here driving, y'all. That, that, that guy over in the corner. Okay, breathing. I heard, I heard heartbeat. I heard blinking. Any, any, any other one? No? Taking the poo. That's like my favorite one, man. Taking the poo. You ever think about it? No, it just happened for you. Sometimes at the worst moment, right? If there's a day or a week goes by and you haven't taken the poo, you be like, oh, I don't think I took a poo. Then you got to go do something about it. If the heart stops beating, you hope. I heard Chief McGee talk about how he be, uh, I ain't going to put him on blast because Chief Master on Air Force Bass over there. But y'all know what he said earlier, right? Y'all remember what Chief McGee told y'all. Y'all hope Chief McGee was paying attention when he did that CBT. You know what I'm talking about? Your heart stopped beating? <laughs> Sir, are you okay? I hope he paid attention to that one. If he didn't pay attention to none of them other ones, I hope he paid attention to that one. Sir, are you okay? You call 911. You grab the AED. Sir, are you okay? Chief McGee, I hope you were listening, bro. I hope you paid attention to that one. If not, go back. Go back and do it again. You have to intervene and do something if it doesn't work. Reptilian brain, it handles the functions we never have to think about. Then there's the limbic brain region. I refer to that, and a lot of folks do, as the emotional brain. And we'll talk about that in a moment. And then the last part is the neocortex. That is where strategery happens. Major project thinking, prioritization, reason, objectivity, it all takes place there. But there's, there's this thing, this thing that, that gets us first, that emotional brain. Can't, you can't bypass it. That's that first filter. 
And inside of that emotional brain, there are these two little wicked things called your amygdala. They're shaped like almonds. Amygdala happens to be Greek for almond. You got two of them, one in the left hemisphere, one in the right hemisphere of your brain. And it is the center that prompts your fight, flight, or freeze. The center that prompts it. It absorbs your environment a hundred times faster than your neocortex. It has a negative bias because it wants to keep you alive. It also looks for belonging cues. Am I safe here? Is this my family? Do I belong? And then there are moments when that amygdala fires and all bets are off. It does not differentiate. It doesn't care if you're in a combat zone, if you're back at home with mom or dad, or if you're inside of a conference room with a commander or a chief who is known for like destroying people. If the slides aren't right and you didn't, you didn't, you didn't update it and you always know those people because it, it'll come up and they'll be like, I, I, up <laughs> I, I updated this slide. Those, those numbers, aren't, those, it must have been the secretary. Those numbers aren't right. I sent, I sent it in. I was ha no, I was having some trouble. I was having some trouble with the TM, the TMT. And the whole time, their heart is beating fast. Their face is flushed. And they're, whole, and they're thinking, run. Yep, that's what happens. <laughs> and so it, it doesn't differentiate. The same thing that would happen to you in a combat zone would happen to you inside of a conference room because it's designed to keep you safe. And so what is it that we're fighting for? That is the question that we have to ask ourselves. This, this slide used to say, what, what are you afraid of losing? And then afterwards, I would always get a bunch of folks that would come up to me and be like, yo, D, bro, I ain't afraid of nothing, man. Look at this face. Does it look like someone who's afraid of anything? No, your slide is wrong. And when I changed it to what are you fighting for, then everybody was like, they were okay with that. Up there, you will see autonomy, value, safety, respect, competency, inclusion. And those are just words until we take that prism and we put it at the top. Now it becomes a dial. And depending on what we are fighting for in the moment, we're turning that dial to fight for autonomy and maybe a little safety. Maybe it's like Wheel of Fortune, and we walked in to work today, and today's just one of them days, and I'm spinning that wheel, and I'm fighting for everything. And if you don't like it, Fight Club in the back. I ain't going to tell you where, because first rule of Fight Club is what? You don't, you don't talk? Well, I guess I already messed up, didn't I? Because I, <laughs> I said Fight Club in the back. What are you fighting for? First question you got to ask yourself. Second, how does it affect you physiologically? And then how does it impact your actions, your decisions, and your behaviors? It's just like the OODA loop. What am I fighting for? What's happening to me physiologically? How is it affecting my actions, my decisions, and my behaviors? Because we all have those dominoes. For me, it's just the way it works. First time, swirling energy in my chest is like bouncing around like I feel it. Doesn't matter what I'm fighting for, the first domino to go, swirling energy in my chest. Second thing is like everybody else in the room starts to kind of sort of disappear. Like it all like starts to fade away. And then I like focus in on the perceived threat. Then I just want to punch you in your two-year-old baby face. You. No, no, no babies were harmed and, and grabbing data for this class. Don't worry, I didn't punch any two-year-olds in the face but you, and that is my setting. Bouncing energy in my chest, everybody else disappears, I'm focusing in on you, and then I begin to go to war to take my autonomy back, or, or to take my respect back, even if that means disrespecting you. I'm a, that's how I'm gonna take it back. My autonomy, you, you just voluntold me to do something? Don't ask me for no slides early, don't ask me for no read aheads, you'll get briefed, when you get briefed, the day that we have to do it, what you, what you mean you wanted something a week in it? Then why would you tell me three weeks from now? You're going to get it three weeks from now. 
I'm fighting to take some of it back. I can't control that I've just been voluntold to do something, but I can control how much effort I give to it. And while I am fighting for it, the other person is fighting for it as well. You have to be intelligent. You have to be good at your job, but you also have to harmonize being emotionally intelligent. What are your dominoes? Because if you don't start to pay attention what happens to you during that moment, you'll constantly have this large loop. The only time you can shrink it is when you start to pay attention and you start to hone in and you start to practice some of these elements. Because what you see on the surface, the hostility, the anger, the frustration, the happiness, the joy, that's just the fruit of it all. If you follow that branch to the tree trunk down into the roots, at the roots you'll find that somebody felt valued. And that's why they enjoy being in the organization. They feel respected. They got tons of room to operate, so they have autonomy. Or that person who, who doesn't feel like they belong, they don't feel included. So now then they don't feel safe. And they, and they don't even ask for anything, so autonomy, whatever. I'm just trying to make it to Friday. I'm just trying to get through the week. I just don't want to bump into Chief Booth today. Don't allow that to be you. Chiefs, I got it. I got it. You just got here. You just inherited this organization, and you didn't do anything to cause the problems that exist. Check. Got it. Not your fault. Wink, wink. You, you didn't do nothing wrong. But guess what? Now it's your responsibility. Not your fault, but now it's your responsibility. How are you going to breathe life back into that environment? How will you reharmonize it? You all have these handouts as well. This last part, values card, bingo. You have these words up on the screen as I begin to close. These are things that you can tangibly and freely give to me as much as you want. You can give me as many or as few things as you want from this list. So now you have these things that you can give to me and no cop outs. Not, not talking about like the organization, right? Like mission always. I'm not talking about my airmen or my guardians. No, I, I give everything because I love airmen. No, that's not what I'm talking about. Me, the leader who doesn't value you. How many of these things are you going to give to me? Zero value. And I'm going to keep that same energy. I hate your face. I, I don't really hate you and I don't want to punch you, but you're like right here. And you keep like making eye contact with me. <laughs> So like, it's making me feel weird. I don't know what to do with my hands now. Right? And so now, I don't like you. Eh, I'm okay with you. You, you back there, like, you my person. And so you get all the autonomy, all the freedom you want. Depends on the day with you. You, you hit and miss, man. But you, you can't get right. How much, if I don't value you, how much of this stuff will you give to me, the leader? What if I told you I valued you at 50%? Man, yeah, every so often you get it right. How much more would you give to me then? What stuff did you hold back on? Because you were thinking, I'm not valued. Man, I'm, not, I'm definitely not giving that. I'm not giving this. There's no way he's going to get this out of me. That happens every day in our organizations. Sometimes, not every time, but sometimes, our airmen give us basic stuff, our guardians give us basic stuff because we have been basic as leaders. That's why. They don't feel valued, they don't feel encouraged. So why would they trust you? Why would they give you personal sacrifice? I don't even feel valued here. Not your fault, but now it's your responsibility. I hope that along this time that we just spent together, that you were able to find one thing that you could accept, one thing that you could begin to practice, and then one thing that you could share. 
If you were able to do that, then you chose your own path towards learning. And you are in the process of being everything to someone that no one ever was for you. Thank you all for your time and spending this moment of your life with me. I appreciate all of y'all. Thank you, Chief Master Sergeant Air Force. Class.